So, I just got finished watching Dorohedoro for the first time. I just got done watching Dorohedoro for the second time. I finished the Dorohedoro anime for the third time. For the fourth! Yes, definitely the fourth time I have finished the 2020 Dorohedoro anime adaptation. Are we good? Am I being honest enough now? Because that's how many times I've seen this show from start to finish since it dropped on Netflix last year. If that's any indication of what I've managed to get myself into, there's a lot to talk about for only having a single 12-episode season, plus an OVA compilation. Let's not beat around the bush, I'm about to talk in an extremely biased way about the best anime to have come out last year, and what a crime it is that I took a year to get what I have to say about it out. Welcome, people of Earth and elsewhere, to the channel of Spam, where today we talk about Mud and Sludge. You know, by all rights, we shouldn't even be here right now. When the Dorohedoro anime was announced, I watched the trailer, and while I was intrigued by this apparent lizard monster swallowing people's heads and seeming to have a living being at the back of his throat, I couldn't say I was sold on bothering to follow the series. All the comments underneath of it that I could actually read basically said that they were hoping for a good adaptation of the manga, which was very adult and very violent. You know, the two things that you can never use to get me to watch a show? It seemed very niche and very just about everything Spam Crackers hates in a show rolled into one messy CGI anime. Does... does this character have a heart for a head? To add to all that, I wasn't the biggest fan of Studio Mappa at the time, because every anime I had seen by them seemed to be losing animation quality halfway through its run. So what if people said it was funny? There's lots of people who find humor in things that don't amuse me in the slightest. And then I had someone talk to me about it that didn't make me any more fond of the idea. Not because they talked about it much or gave me any spoilers or anything, but just the context of the show being brought up kind of made me roll my eyes. So yeah, there was not a modicum of interest to be found here. I didn't bother watching clips as they showed up in my YouTube feed, which they did. I got used to seeing this trippy thumbnail used for the show's opening and what appeared to be a giant fan favorite muscle lady. I watched other shows and waited for the hype to disappear. Or at least what hype I could see, it seemed pretty popular to me. That was before we got the announcement that MAPPA was going to be handling another, much more popular series entering its final arc. Yeah, Wit Studio handed off the Attack on Titan Reigns for the final season, and the promo trailer for it looked... interesting? I could've sworn that it was completely 3D animated while I was watching it, like there was a really big hubbub about it. Now, that was something I definitely was going to end up watching, for closure if nothing else. So, Mappa, you're going to keep going the CGI route? Can we expect consistency of animation with that? I wonder, I wonder, I wonder. Well, that other CGI Mappa show just so happens to have dropped on Netflix, and it's all dubbed and stuff, so... fine. I'll be curious. Let's watch the violent, gritty, head-chomping Lizard Man show. Oh gosh, what did I just get myself into? Break it, calm, break it down, die, show a death. Sag it, gosh, shake it, so it, cause you break your honor. Hey, who am I? So, what is this show even about? Well, it's based off of the manga of the same name by Q Hayashida. It centers around a post-apocalyptic world where Kaiman, a bespelled amnesiac lizard man, hunts sorcerers in an attempt to figure out his true identity. That's the short and sweet explanation, anyway. To drag it out a little longer, the only hint he has in his endeavor is what appears to be a person who becomes visible to any given sorcerer when Kaiman bites their head. This apparition only speaks a single sentence that presumably either confirms or denies the sorcerer's involvement in the incident that left Kaiman the way he is. Between the sorcerers being generally considered dangerous and looking outwardly identical to normal humans, hunting them is a task. Add that onto the fact that they live in another realm that can only be reached by magically generated doors, the one who looks nothing like a caiman has his job cut out for him. Luckily for him, he has a few assets on his side. First and foremost, that magic is ineffective against him for some reason. Secondly, that he is a formidable fighter in his own right. And third, his partner in crime, Nikaido, who also kicks major butt. 
Of course, it turns out they are a bit too good at their job, and when the wrong people start looking into them, well, let's just say that's where the story really starts. I once had it asked to me when I personally realized I was really enjoying the series, and the answer was, a spoiler! But suffice it to say that it was actually pretty early in the show. The mystery elements of Dorohidoro are very intriguing, and they unfold at an even pace. Nothing is revealed too quickly, and the parts that are given to the audience present more elements to be solved without being frustrating about it. In regard to the ever-present violence and gore of the series, it's not as overbearing or edgy as I was given to believe. Because of the narrative, settings, and characters, the brutality we see comes across as an inevitable hazard, rather than something made to leave the viewers in shock or fear. Somewhere between the hole and the world of the sorcerers, you're pretty much prepared for the blood fountains and ripped off faces from the get-go, That, and we get some of the violence right off the bat. It's really more fascinated than heavy-handed. Granted, I am an adult now, and I can't speak to whether or not a younger version of myself who hadn't seen Akira, Attack on Titan, or even Bakuno would have had the same feelings, so remember to take that with a pinch of salt. Seeing as the worlds of Dorohidoro are grim, hazardous, and all-around hellish, so naturally the people living there would be as well. And let me tell you, that's where the series really shines. The characters are the backbone of this story, and they are the most perfect motley crew of morally gray psychos and murderers I have seen since Bakano. And it takes something very special to get me to like pretty much all the named recurring folks. If Kaiman's primary motivation doesn't immediately get you invested in him as our lead, Maybe his alternate escapades of working in a magic victim's hospital ward and scraping free meals out of Nikaido's restaurant does. And she doesn't seem to mind. She's a self-reliant lady who's also very caring and generally good-natured. Our antagonist for this season, N, is a magic crime lord obsessed with mushrooms and himself. A narcissist and tyrant through and through, somehow he manages to be just as endearing. His cleaners are some of the most dangerous people to run into, but they're also foodie dorks the underlings can look up to. Shin is a mutt who is surprisingly level-headed given his origin, and Noe is adorable in spite of her monster size and strength. For real, she is the best girl, it's no wonder everybody loves her. The misadventures of Fujita and Ebisu are always relevant to the main plot, and a majority of the secondary cast leave just as strong an impression. In spite of the oppressive, miserable settings, there is also something upbeat and generally hilarious about the presentation as the adventures of the cast unfold. Their eccentric, colorful personalities and interactions between friends, enemies, and rivals alike are genuinely enjoyable. There's not a boring scene in this show as a result. It's actually funny! Like, so funny! I've had a hard time emphasizing how much I laughed while watching this show. And for me personally, that's something that can't be overlooked. I mean, if you told me any earlier in my anime watching life that I would be excited to see a giant, computer-generated mutant cockroach play baseball, I would have called you crazy. And, uh, speaking of, uh, computer-generated... I am generally not a fan of CGI anime. This was something that was easier to say five or ten years ago before Japanese CGI really started getting its legs under it. These days, 3D Japanese movies can look like they came out of Leica or even Pixar, that's how far we've come. However, those are working on movie time and movie budgets, but what about serialized TV anime budgets and resources? Well, it's not quite as nice, but some studios like Orange have managed to impress the anime community with work on series like Land of the Lustrous and Beastars that rely on 99% of their assets being modeled, rigged, and rendered in 3D. Throw in some fantastic cinematography and we've got series that are both narratively compelling and not horrifying to behold in 3D motion. But that's Orange, not MAPPA. Up until this point, my experience with MAPPA's 3D work were the kinds of things that were very commonplace in Japanese animation. Namely backgrounds, crowds, and monsters. Things that I have never felt were particularly well integrated no matter where they showed up. Listen, I know 3D TV anime has been getting less and less stilted to look at, and we're all used to vehicles and mechs standing out from their environments by now, but the integration still bothers me a lot. I know it's easier to animate a model of the Colossal Titan than to draw every frame that is relevant to it, but I still don't like it. It doesn't look good. Integration is what's really hard to do effectively. That is, with the inconsistent use of 3D models along with having characters double in 2D. That's the kind of thing that bothers me. It bothered me in Sea Control, it bothered me in Juni Tyson, it even bothered me in Demon Slayer, and most people agree that UFO Bull knocked that one out of the park. What does MAPPA think they can do? 
Well, uh, as it turns out, it's actually really dang close to godliness. What Doro Hidoro, a series that had a cult following and an apprehensive smaller fan base looking forward to its anime decided to do, was invert the typical formula of CGI asset integration into a 2D anime. Yes, I said it was 2D. I didn't even notice how much of it was more traditionally anime until the third or fourth watch, and it blows my mind looking back through this footage. Where your usual anime will take all of its most important characters and focus their efforts into making them look the best they can in 2D, and then supplement the less important assets like, again, crowds, set pieces, vehicles, monsters, and robots with CGI, MAPPA decided to let the bulk of their important characters be CGI modeled and supplement everything else in 2D. And it worked. Phenomenally. Say what now? Okay, let me explain to the best of my understanding. All of the major characters have 3D models, and since characters tend to not wear the same things constantly in these series, each model has a number of outfits that were given to them depending on the character's scenes. I have to mention the outfits because that's where we find consistency in whether or not the models are present. It's based pretty much entirely on the amount of screen time any given character has and what outfit they happen to be wearing. And in case the transition to this talking point didn't make it apparent, I'm gonna let the guy with the heart head be the focus of the explanation. And this is the part you'll actually want to watch to see what I'm talking about, if you've just been listening to this video this far in. Jin is an important character with a lot of screen time. Proportionally speaking, it's just easier to estimate all the time he has in this specific outfit, model it, and animate wherever it's easiest and most convincing to place said model. It starts getting really fun when you spot bits of things that are just out of place enough that it would be easier to draw him by hand instead of altering the asset. For example, when Shin is wearing his mask correctly, or when he's riled up and you can see his pupils. I just mentioned how my biggest issue with 3D assets and generally 2D anime is how they appear when they are integrated together, and I'm going to use a specific scene in episode 2 to show how Doro Hidoro has managed to master this art. At the beginning of this scene, Shin and Noe's models are both present sitting on this couch as they wait for a job update. Noe remarks to Shin that he should probably have his mask facing forward or N might have something to say about it. Now, I'll put too fine a point on this. Shin's model is likely not made to wear the mask the correct way, because he usually doesn't. The time it would take to remodel or rig the mask to actually work facing forward likely didn't outweigh the time it would take to draw and animate by hand the number of frames where it is present. So again, Shin is 2D wherever the front-facing mask is needed, which isn't very often. Now, as Shin turns the mask around, it's fairly convincing movement, but if you look closely, you might notice the trick where the hands are positioned, so you don't notice that it's not the mask that's turning, it's the entire head on the model. Not a standout thing, again, I didn't notice until I was actually analyzing the animation for things like the mask specifically. When the movement is finished, we now have 2D Shin sitting next to 3D Noi, or a very convincingly integrated 2D head on Shin's model. I can't tell, just like this, and the more I watch the scene, the more I wonder, like... When it's later revealed that they were just going to end up taking the masks off for this dinner meeting anyway, we transition very smoothly back to the 3D model. Right here. Whoa. This is followed even more smoothly by Noe removing her coat and mask in 2D before quickly reverting back to her model, which is now in a different outfit. The more you take the presence of the clothing and such into account, the more these kinds of transitions become apparent. While Noe might have the most outfits per model, I think, for a character in this series, even she has exceptions. You see, I still haven't managed to pin when and where Demon Slayer decides to use its 3D models. Doro Hidoro manages to make it make sense as it easily swings back and forth between two and three dimensions. Animations that are particularly gritty and detailed are handled in 2D, while major fight scenes maintain the models of the 3D characters pretty consistently. In some scenes, it is genuinely difficult to tell when they do and don't use 3D models where the main characters are present because of how convincingly they interact with the 2D characters and environment. And this is just talking about characters specifically, never mind backgrounds, vehicles, and smaller assets. I mean, I'd have to say that a good majority of this show, you could have it playing, pause it, and randomly take a screenshot of that moment, and it would look like it was just a regular 2D anime. I'm blown away. 3D assets are generally used to save time by filling out unimportant details or things too complicated to effectively and consistently animate well by hand, but by turning the method on its head, MAPPA actually managed to make the best anime integration between 2 and 3D animation that I've ever seen. Y'all can tell me if any of my analysis seems wrong, but we've gotta give credit where credit is due. 
It is actually amazing what they've done with the animation in this show, to the point where I could make a separate video pointing out the transitions and consistency between the different styles. Just say the word and I'll do it! Fujita especially is a super interesting case that I like to point things out about. Okay, but before we move on to the music, just let me point out that the most important thing to take away from this spiel is that it actually looks good from start to finish. Congrats, Mappa, you actually managed to impress me and didn't skimp out on the 2D elements like I thought you would. From episodes 1 to 12, you did a fantastic job. You didn't do the same service to the OVAs, but they're not overtly important, and I guess it's not a crime to make glorified animatics for shorts like these, so we'll shrug that off as if they weren't any less entertaining for it. Also, we should take into account things like the shaky camera movement, which is a lot more present than I initially realized. Also, I just have to point out this long shot of Kaiman ordering a pizza. That was pretty funny to watch. Actually, it still amuses me every time I see it. Now, I am not an audiophile. I don't usually bother reviewing anime music unless it actually stands out to me. I have to really like a show in order to start listening to the soundtrack. And I have to say, with confidence, the soundtrack for Doro Hedoro is a mix of so many genres it perfectly encapsulates the feeling of the show. From the grungy, angst music of the more intense moments to the lighthearted pop of the comedic ones, there's a song for every mood here. Shin's theme is an accordion waltz, by the way, I just need to point that out for reasons. The opening sequence is a trippy one with a banger of a song. It somehow manages to spoil everything and nothing about the series at the same time, while maintaining the generally chaotic feeling of it. Then there are the endings, which this review wouldn't be complete without me mentioning. There are six of them, and we can debate from dawn to dusk which one of them is the most fire, but you know what? I love them all. The third ending, while being one of the weaker songs in my opinion, is one of the most interesting to watch because it's a Mushroom Doom mod, and I mean, you've gotta watch that all the way through at least once, right? Yep, I totally watched the series four times, and I loved it every time. Probably gonna do it again when I can't think of anything new to watch. By this point, I've also read the manga, and I hope to the anime gods that we get more seasons in the future, because gosh dang it, we've only hit the tip of the iceberg with how great the series is. There are so many other characters and moments, it really doesn't disappoint. But that's just me gushing. Do I really recommend this series for people to watch? Well, instead of me saying who I think would enjoy this series like I did, I'll go ahead and I'll say who I think this series isn't for. Bearing in mind that this manga is a seinen, which means its primary demographic is for adult men, you can see how it separates itself from most shonen very easily. It's rated TV mature for good reason. If you, or someone you know, is really averse to violence, blood, and gore, then maybe give this series a pass. If you're fine with watching Attack on Titan, keep in mind that Doro Hidoro is about a cut above that in terms of pure viscera, but you should probably be fine. Generally speaking, there's not a lot of crass language as of Season 1, just some pretty typical amounts of swearing, but that should be kept in mind as well. Also, boob warning! While the nudity in this series is mostly situational and comedic as opposed to coming across like gratuitous etchy, again, I'm sure that's something you'd want to be warned about. Anything else? Oh yeah, the devils. There are a lot of demons, devils, inverted crosses, and 666s in this series imagery, especially in the world of the sorcerers. So if magic, devil contracts, and general hellish references make you uncomfortable for whatever reason you may have, Doro Hidoro might cross some lines. On the other hand, if you watch stuff like Helsing, or Has Been Hotel and Hell of a Boss, Black Butler, and had no problem with that kind of thing, then there's probably nothing in this show that would make you bat an eye. There you go, those are all the warnings. If none of those kinds of things bother you, then by all means, Doro Hidoro is a heck of a good time, so I absolutely recommend you check out the anime. Oh, and just to answer the controversial dubs or subs question, the answer is, I don't know. I watched it in English, and I enjoyed it in English. So whatever your preference is, watch it that way. I'm sure it's good in Japanese as well. Mystery and macabre, horror and hilarity, violent and somehow incredibly heartfelt, Doro Hidoro has not only made its way into being what I consider the best anime to come out in the year 2020, but probably the best thing I've seen in several years prior to that. 
easily sneaking into my heart of top two personal favorites, I am going to promote it to hell and back because this series deserves so much recognition. So I'm going to give it as much as it can get. Moving forward, I hope that a second season can be seen sometime in the future, as the manga has been completed as of 2018. I know MAPPA has its handful with other projects at this point, so a bit of waiting may be in order, but that's okay. I can wait if it means we get to maintain this level of quality. But dang, I want more. I really gotta get more of this series. And that would be it for this review. Thank you, people of Earth and Elsewhere, for watching this if you've come here from the beginning and managed to watch it all the way through to the end. I hope you got some insight or enjoyment out of this and are taking my recommendation seriously. Now, if you have any thoughts on the series, whether you love or hate it, are impartial or even apathetic to it, I'd love to know. Did I get anything wrong or forget to point out some of the series' glaring flaws? Tell me. Hit me with all of your thoughts. Then again, you could always just say I did a good job if that's how you feel as well. And if you would like to see more videos like this, check out some of my other work. Or, dare I say it, subscribe for more content! I have a number of Doro Hidoro videos I want to make in the future, so if you like the series, then I might have something cool planned in the near future. If you're interested in the picture, you can check out this and my other art on my DeviantArt in the description below, along with other social media links if you feel so inclined to check out me on other platforms. Psst! Make sure you check out my Instagram specifically for an all-ages fantasy comedy comic that really helped me figure out some new techniques for coloring and shading on pieces like this one. New pages are updated weekly. Now without further ado, people of Earth and elsewhere, this has been the Spam Channel, where I am Crackers. Thank you once again for giving me your time, and I'm hoping to catch you in the next video. Doro Hedoro Manga Review when? No promises, but hopefully soon. Ciao! What do you mean the only Nendroid available for this series is the Gyoza Fairy? And it's not even out yet! For crying out loud, people, please watch this show!